Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kathy Greenler Sexton from the SIIA. This is the webinar Profiting from Public Domain Data, and welcome. Before we get started, I just wanted to make sure everybody gets the most out of this webinar. We have a Q&A feature in our ReadyTalk webinar software. It's on your lower left-hand side. Please feel free to ask questions. To answer the few questions that have already been coming in, I can see this is going to be an active and engaged group. Um, yes, we are recording. As you just heard, uh, there will be the slide deck available to you, and you can download that. We, can, uh, we will also be sending the link and the deck out after the webinar. So um, if you have any questions uh, about the SIIA, suggestions uh, for further webinars, or even technical issues, just feel free to send me a note at the email you see on your screen. And for the uh, Twitter uh, posters, the hashtag is SIIA.net. For those who are familiar with the SIIA, this is probably a very familiar chart, but I always like to make sure that we have an uh, overview of who we are and what we're doing. Our mission for the Software and Information Industry Association is to promote, protect, educate, and enable business development for our industry. And at the core of the SIIA is, is our public policy initiatives. We're working on things like now, on now such as data, uh, piracy. There's a lot of great work on patent trolls. Uh, you can check our site if you're interested in any of these and a host of other issues that we're working on at www.siia.net. We also offer anti-piracy services to help uh, software providers and information providers understand who is using and not using, more importantly, uh, their intellectual property uh, correctly and supporting them with any potential uh, corrective measures. Uh, around the heart of our public policy and anti-piracy work are the industry-focused divisions uh, that are the SIIA. I run the content division, uh, and closely aligned are my sister divisions, the Specialized Information Publishing uh, Association Division, and effective July 1st, the Association of Business Media, ABM. We have an education technology division focused on the K-20 through sector, a software division which is focused on all the issues of building and selling software, especially with cloud and mobile. And many information providers, publishers, media companies are now software providers. So there's a lot of cross-division activity uh, that we're doing there. And for our members who are focused in for selling into the public sector, our PSIG division is great. They, uh, one of the great things they do is uh, set up meetings with buyers in the government sector to, to meet members. Uh, it's a great, great program. And our FISD division is focused on uh, financial information. Uh, many of our, our uh, live financial information providers are, are members worldwide of that division. So that is the SIIA. Uh, we encourage you to come to our events. Uh, we encourage you to be members, and as members, uh, you get to participate across all of the SIIA. I'd encourage you to also mark your calendars. Uh, we have a lot of activities. This is just a slice of activities that are coming up in the, uh, in the information content uh, media space that we're offering. Uh, mark your calendars. This week, actually, we have an Info Local New York event. Uh, so if you're in, your, in uh, New York, come by and see us. We also have an investment conference in New York on Thursday. We have a technology showcase in New York at the McGraw-Hill Financial Building. And if you are a publisher and want to understand technologies to help your publishing organization, this might be a great afternoon uh, spent. Uh, it's, it's in New York, but it's also going to be simulcast on the web. Uh, and I have to uh, not finish my comments without mentioning data content. Um, our partner uh, in producing data content is the Info Commerce Group and the very talented Russ Perk Perkins and his team. Uh, that is October 15 through 17. And today's webinar is really uh, a taste of the types of issues that we're going to be tackling at data content. So with that intro, I'm now going to uh, turn the mic and the mouse 
over to Russell Perkins to really talk to you today about the main event, which is, is uh, leveraging and profiting from public domain data. Russell? Thanks, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Russell Perkins. I'm the uh, founder and managing director of a company called InfoCommerce Group. We are primarily a consulting company that focuses on business information um, content broadly, but with a real uh, area of expertise around uh, structured data products. Uh, we started the uh, Data Content Conference uh, over 20 years ago, believe it or not, and are now partnering with uh, SIIA to produce that every year. And last year we acquired a business called Subscription Site Insider, which is really designed for um, uh, companies that are selling online subscription content products, and it provides them with a um, uh, very tactical view of, of, of their business from in terms of best practices and, and research and, and benchmarking uh, to help grow their businesses. So we come at um, business information a number of different ways, and and integral to that is is really. Um, how do you build a database? How do you source it? Do you do it through primary research? Or in the case of our topic today, how do you access um, uh, public domain data to either build a, a database or to enhance or augment a database you already have? And that's, that's where we're going to dive in and, and focus the conversation today. Uh, this really isn't a definition of public data. It's more of a definition of what I'm planning to talk about. But I did want to note that there are varying definitions of what public data means to different people. And if you get really expansive with it, that could go up to and including everything that's available on the public web. Uh, for the purposes of a one-hour webinar, I wanted to pull that back a bit. And really what I'd like to focus on today is uh, databases that are built and maintained by government agencies, both at the uh, federal and state level. Uh, we're going to talk about databases that um, contain information that is in the public domain, uh, meaning that's accessible to us. Uh, and we're going to really, again, primarily focus on databases that contain either transactional or entity level data as opposed to aggregate or statistical data. I'm going to mention statistical content here or there, but that, that's a uh, topic that, that's worthy of a, a webinar in its own right. So again, we're going to look for sort of basically company type information and what's available um, and how it's being used and how you should think about putting it to use in your own organization. So what's available out there in terms of public domain databases really is, is truly remarkable. Let me give you just a flavor of it very quickly. Uh, some of you may know some of this, uh, some, uh, but I'm not sure anyone knows the full extent of this. And I don't claim to know everything that's out there, but this is a, a wonderful taste. Uh, did you know, for example, that you can get the full tax return filings of almost every nonprofit and foundation in the country? Did you know? You could get product level detail on, on almost every incoming shipment of goods into this country. Did you know that you could get uh, detailed financial in information on almost every uh, 401k plan and pension plan that, that uh, is based in this country? And uh, in the area of professional data, you also have access to things like the licensing status, contact information, and to some varying degrees of background information on every lawyer and physician in this country, along with another, another number of other professions as well. Um, if you move down to sort of the, the county level, you, you can actually get your hands on property ownership records. And that would include information such as the mortgage holder's name, the amount of the mortgage, property tax assessments. And you can get this for almost every home, every residential, and commercial property in the country. Uh, and if you back up to the federal level again, you can find things like uh, every federal and state environmental law violation for every business in the country. And add on top of that, you can get uh, all their warnings, fines, and violations relating to occupational safety and health as well. So I mean, that's just a few almost random examples. But um, hopefully that's got your uh, head spinning with potential applications, and you're all ready to hear more about this. Because if this type of data uh, has appealed to you, you're absolutely in the right webinar. <laughs> 
So let's start with sort of the basics. Um, I want to give you a little bit of grounding on, on what types of information is out there, where it comes from, how you should think about it, and also importantly how the people who are creating these databases think about it. Because I, I think there's uh, sort of a basic divergence there that, that's worth understanding because it's going to make it easier for you to, um, to source and, and access these types of uh, data sources. Public data sets are often created solely for the purpose of maintaining a record. And that, that's an important mindset because the, the public agencies that are gathering information, whether it's for compliance or regulatory purposes, um, they're really just trying to record the information that they've gathered. And, and surprisingly, and, and this may change over the next few years, but you rarely see them being used for sophisticated analytics or automated compliance testing or even to generate aggregate statistics. Statistics. It really is just a filing cabinet of sorts for these agencies. And it's important to, to understand that a lot of them continue to think that way. And that trickles down in, in, in a number of ways that has important considerations for all of us. Uh, for example, you'll often see a lot of these um, government databases are very poorly architected. They're built um, mostly just to contain information, not really to get at the information or, or drive reports off it. Uh, it's really storage again. Uh, and that creates complexity, but for someone who wants to exploit a commercial opportunity, I look at that as an opportunity because it makes it a little harder for everyone and his brother to go and get and use the data. Uh, you'll often find these databases have uh, poor data entry quality and their, and their data, in, data hygiene is somewhere between poor and non-existent. Again, uh, for someone who wants to monetize these types of things, you've got an opportunity um, because you can take on that cleaning and, and normalization task and add value and, and separate yourself from others who might get their hands on the data. It's uh, exceedingly rare to see uh, government databases that have been enhanced with third-party data, uh, whether it's from other uh, public domain databases or for private data sources. Again, this is an opportunity for you to use your smarts and, and, and take advantage of the opportunities you see in the marketplace to build out a, a more powerful database than uh, you can get your hands on for free. And this often means uh, because the way these agencies think about the data as it just being a glorified filing cabinet, that these data sets are often obscure if not actually hidden from the public. Not for any nefarious reason, it's just uh, honestly, I, I've heard more than a few people within agencies saying things like, why on earth would you want that? Uh, and it's important to understand that because a lot of this stuff sort of exists in, in, in a fog in the back offices somewhere, and it does take a, a little extra work to, to find these things and get your hands on them. But again, I see that as an opportunity because it stops everyone else from diving in and grabbing the data and, and being able to put it to ready use. You'll know, um, and you've, I'm sure you've seen this yourself, a lot of government agencies do put a lot of their databases online, but in many cases it's, it's something just short of duress they're doing it. Um, Generally, the motivation is they want to reduce inquiries coming into them just to make it easier to, to let you self-serve on stuff that they'd otherwise have to deal with. Uh, sometimes it's done to show that the agency is being transparent and, and responsive to, to the public. Uh, but it's a rare agency that, that's seriously interested in putting its, its data front and center and doing a good job with it. And even uh, agencies that put some data up will often not put other data up. And it, it almost seems uh, uh, at least to this outsider to be um, random sometimes exactly what gets prioritized. Uh, but again, it's sort of uh, important to understand the other side of this. When an agency puts a database online, uh, that's typically the end objective, to get it online. If, if anyone gets a reward, it's for simply doing it, not doing it particularly well. And as a consequence of this, you'll often find very valuable, useful databases are hidden on the agency website. They're just kind of obscured because nobody thought they were interesting enough to, to put them in the nav bar or mention them on the home page. Uh, it's very common to see poor user interfaces, which makes the data very difficult to work with uh, and very uh, intimidating to the casual user. It's, again, very rare for an agency to have a budget for SEO, and, and very few times is there really any interest. It's the notion of it's there if you want it, go find it, as opposed to uh, we really want to make the world aware of the fact that this is out here. 
a lot of these uh, databases behind the scenes tend to be very customized, um, and they often depend on very complex and, and baffling nomenclature, which makes it um, hard to use these things. You can often go into some of these online agency databases and do a query and get uh, a totally inappropriate result because you don't understand how the data is organized behind the scenes, how they're thinking about it, or what some of their terminology means to them, and it could have uh, perhaps a non-standard interpretation, or you assume it means something that it doesn't. And um, you'll rarely find uh, that there's any available site support, and more times than not, you won't even find user instructions. So even though there's a lot of government databases coming online at government websites, um, they're in many respects um, their, their own worst enemies. They're, they're doing it almost because they have to or they feel they ought to, not because they're excited about it or really trying to uh, make these things uh, truly available uh, in a way that the general public can come in and do anything with them. So the mere fact they're there doesn't mean that uh, they, you've obviated an opportunity for yourself. Uh, it, it's worth taking a look at what they've done and how they've done it. Uh, but it doesn't say, oh, it's online, therefore there's no opportunity left, left any, anything but that. And while there are initiatives out there like data.gov, which I'll talk about more later, uh, these are frankly well-intentioned, but at the very much early stage as far as, as making government data more accessible and, and doing it in a, in a centralized uh, location with, with some standards around presentation and downloads. So having said all that, uh, let's, let's, let's sort of recap why public databases should be interesting to you. You've got the potential opportunity of low cost or even no cost data acquisition. I would note, though, that there's a lot of variability in updating frequency, so be careful uh, when you're dealing with these files. Some of them are updated sporadically, some of them every couple years. Some of them could be updated in real time. They vary dramatically. Uh, many of these databases, because they are regulatory or compliance in nature, have what I call census characteristics to them, which means that they really include everyone who's in a given industry or in, in, a, in a specific profession. And there's a lot of hidden value there because you have, if you can get a database to a point where it's fully inclusive of an industry, uh, you can offer a lot more value to your customers in turn because you can uh, produce more useful statistics. You can be a much uh, better way to monitor the marketplace. Uh, and you can just be a more definitive, important source of information. Uh, so you always want to look for an opportunity where you can build out to having a census characteristic to your data set. Um, public data often gives you uh, available data that you can't get anywhere else um, because they can ask for things that we can't and get it, um, but there's an opportunity to leverage that. I'd also note that um, public domain databases often offer what could be called high trust uh, data because they're the information is being gathered uh, under penalty of law, if you will, meaning that the people are, are being required to an answer truthfully. And that's a much higher standard than uh, any commercial data producer can, can, can aspire to. Uh, so again, you've got not only uh, sometimes comprehensive data, you have uh, generally trustworthy data as well. And the wildest thing, if you haven't done this before, and, and the funniest thing, and in some respects the best thing, is once you get a database from a government agency, uh, clean it up and do something useful with it, uh, you can be virtually guaranteed they will buy it back from you, often in volume and quantity. And it could be a meaningful percentage of your overall revenue. And I've seen this literally dozens of times with companies who've done it. Um, so just the fact that they have it doesn't mean that they have it in a particularly usable format. And someone who can do it better uh, will find that they can uh, often sell it back to the source. So it all sounds pretty good, right? So are we speaking of rainbows and pots of gold out there? Um, I put some cautions out at this point and, and say not quite. Yes, you can access um, high value, high quality data at low or no cost. But, and this is critically important, everyone else can too. And that means that you're going to have to work a little harder to have a product that has real value in the marketplace and that is uh, competitively defensible. Uh, 
as I've just said, a lot of government agencies are putting their databases online for free. Some of them are getting into the zone of, of competence at this point. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no opportunity left, but it does create some competitive pressures and you need to factor that into your analysis. And there's just a lot of disruptive players out there too, and a lot of them are very attracted to public data because they're much more interested in the application than actually making the data. So if they can get their hands on something that's ready to go, it's very exciting to them. And these, these players will sometimes come into the market with an ad-based model which allows them to offer uh, information for free, um, or sometimes just going to put it out there plain old for free just to build traffic and eyeballs with the hope of monetizing it down the road. And that can be very disruptive to um, uh, companies that are trying to build a product that they're charging for. And I uh, just wanted to throw out there one of my favorite quotes from Eric Schmidt of Google. Um, free is not going to go away and it's still attractive to an awful lot of companies. Generally speaking, uh, the people on this call, I think, would be more interested in trying to find subscription revenue from it. Uh, the two things can coexist, but free obviously put, tends to put a lot of pressure on uh, subscription-based products with roughly the same content, which again is one of the reasons you have to think about uh, both value add and, and competitive differentiation. But just in case I got you too nervous there, I did want to back up again and said, yes, there is absolutely uh, opportunity here with public databases. All I'm saying is it's just not quite as easy as it used to be. I think the days of easy pickings are gone. I think that's because uh, people tend to be more aware of the possibilities, meaning there's more people looking for this data and, and actually putting it to use, meaning more competition. There's those disruptive players uh, that I've mentioned before, uh, just previously. And whenever you're in a situation situation where the cost of goods is, is low or nothing, uh, you're going to have commoditization potential, meaning that uh, if you come in and offer it for a dollar, someone's going to come in and offer it for 50 cents, and someone else will show up and offer it for 25 cents, and you get this sort of race to the bottom that, that can kill everyone. And again, the only real answer to that is to differentiate your product by adding value to it. And we're going to talk about some of those specifics. I'd also note that um, there's a lot more capability out there in terms of data cleansing and matching and manipulation. And that means that things that just weren't even possible five years ago are being done kind of routinely and, and sometimes at a great scale. And that often has the impact of knocking out some of the opportunity for smaller players because something, somebody has gone and done something big and bold and massive. Uh, it knocks out some of the niche opportunities. And, and one of the things I might point to is, is Zillow in this case, which, which did the un, unthinkable really and went out and got um, property records from all over the country. I mean, and that means probably thousands of different um, jurisdictions and was able to um, normalize all that data and smooth it out and build it into a product that had all this uh, very powerful information on home value that they turned into a very successful business. Now that probably knocked out some opportunities for people who wanted to play with property data but do something less ambitious than that. Uh, but the point is there's just a lot of people uh, and often with, with good resources and skills uh, playing around in the public data area now. So you really always have to keep your antenna up to see what's going on out there in the marketplace. So some of the things I would um, point to as keys to success if you're going to work with public data, um, this one's sort of self-evident, but at the same time always bears repeating don't uh, go out to sell public data just because you can get your hands on it. Uh, you really want to find out from the potential buyers of this data, A, if they would use it, and B, how they would use it. Understanding that is really important. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, a meaningful value add is a base requirement. If you're excited about public data because you think you can go out, uh, snag yourself a database, scrub it up a little, and then make money from it, you're probably in for an unpleasant surprise. Those opportunities are very, very rare these days. And even as new databases come onto the marketplace, uh, there's a lot more people who have their eyes open to those opportunities as well. I also urge you to think past um, CAS and NCOA for those of you who are familiar with those um, um, 
to applications because I, I hear this a lot in meetings. Oh, well, we've got the database and it's, we've really done a lot. We've added value. We put it through CAS and NCOA. All those two things are, are, are software programs. The first one really, all it does is standardize the addresses and make sure the, the address is valid. It doesn't tell you anything about whether the business um, whose address you're standardizing is actually there. And NCOA is, is a national change of address database and you can feed your uh, database through it and, and find out if a, if a company has moved, which is useful. But that, uh, you're not adding tremendous value, but I still, uh, sit in meetings and hear people talk about these things in hushed tones as if they've done something really remarkable. And, uh, and frankly, when I'm talking about adding value, I'm talking about thinking a lot past uh, doing routine uh, data hygiene steps like those. If you've spoken with your prospective customers, if you really understand how they would use the data, then you're in a position to build a specific application around the data. And I think that's really the key to success these days. The days when you could really just take a whole bunch of data, uh, convince yourself there's value at it, and then throw it out to the customers and say, you figure out how it's valuable to you. I think those days are largely gone. Increasingly, uh, the successes I'm seeing are increasingly niche successes, where people are using data to ta tackle a known specific problem. Uh, the nice thing about it is once you've identified these highly conscribed, these specific applications, then the functionality requirements become very clear and you can build a more powerful application that goes beyond the data itself to some of the tools to act on the data. And guess what? Then it's a very short hop to start thinking about getting into customer workflow which uh, is where you really want to be if you're a data publisher. The other thing, uh, again, and I, I sort of going to hit on this four or five different times in the course of this presentation, but understand that the days where you could really just grab a database and, and sell it as, as a glorified uh, contact list or mailing list, those days are largely gone. You've really got to do more with the data at this point than, than simply scrub it clean and offer it for sale. And what I would hold out to you, and this is going to be a big part of this presentation, is I think that the opportunities to monetize specific data elements are more numerous and, and frankly more interesting than the opportunities to monetize entire public domain data sets. And I'm, I'm going to get more specific about this. But I, I'm, I'm really thinking that it's not just grabbing a freestanding database and trying to do something with it. It's saying, where can I get data, even if it's in multiple places, uh, that can help me address a specific information need or our application in a specific vertical market. So let, let, me, uh, let me throw this out, how this may start to work for you. I'm just going to create these random scenarios for you and we can start getting a little bit more specific about data. And, and let's say, for example, that you had a database of, of all the retail outlets in the United States. And you've heard from your customers that a lot of that ethnic marketing, ethnic products are becoming uh, very important out there and you want to find a way to help your subscribers target um, retailers that are most likely to be interested in, in ca carrying different kinds of ethnic specialty items. How would you go about it? Well, one approach would be to go to the uh, Census Bureau and overlay area demographics for ethnicity. And, and there's a particular link that will take you to that data file. So then what you can do is either at the zip code level or even down to the census tract level, you'll be able to um, append to each store in your database uh, what percentage of their neighborhood is, is is Asian or Latino, and you've got all these different um, criteria available to you so that your customers then would have the ability to sort on that as a criteria and narrow down a list of highly qualified prospects. Uh, another thing might be uh, someone who decides there's a need to build a database of small nonprofits that there's all the big nonprofits are well known and, 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 and have been talking to, but what you want to do is offer up the um, the big nonprofits of tomorrow by allowing marketers to get to them while they're still small. How would you go about that? 
Um, well, one approach is that you could go to the IRF and ask them for their Form 990N database, which is uh, a, a filing that's specifically done for small nonprofits. And there, in fact, is the actual link you can go to to download that information, and, and you'd be in business. Now, again, I'd urge you to think about how to add value to it, but a wonderful way to sort of kick off a new database. In my third example, um, say you've got a database of um, commercial vehicle fleets out there, and that they obviously valuable targets for a whole bunch of reasons because people can sell them tires and supplies and new trucks and who, whatever else that vehicle fleets need. Um, one of the things you'd like to do for your customers is identify those fleets that are showing persistent safety issues. And the reason you want to do that is for sales prospecting so that people who sell insurance, people who sell uh, safety equipment, people who sell remedial training programs can target the commercial fleets that have the most problems. How would you go about that? Well, one approach would be to go to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and ask them for their safety and fitness reports database, which happens to be available at that link. And in that database is actually the number of safety violations that they've had over different periods of time. So it's relatively easy to overlay that onto your existing database of commercial fleets and identify those ones with specific safety problems. And you can see what I'm doing in a number of these examples is I'm saying don't use the uh, public database necessarily as your starting point. Use it, think about the opportunity also to augment and enhance a database you, you might already have. Just a couple more scenarios. Let's say you have a database of companies that are engaged in research and development. And you're interested in monitoring uh, how many patents these companies are awarded because you want to use that as a proxy for the scale and the intensity of their R&D activity. How would you go about that? One approach might be to go to the Patent and Trademark Office and, and uh, pull data from their patent database, which is available at that link. And the number of patents or patents that have been assigned to them is something that you can roll up and monitor over time and, again, use as a proxy to say these, these are very active R&D programs, these are less active R&D programs. Another scenario might be uh, someone who has a database of radio and television stations, and they want to really build out that database by building a, a comprehensive ownership history for each station, which would be somewhere between difficult and impossible to do on your own. But in this case, your approach might be to go to the FCC and get their historical license applications database, download that, and append it to your uh, existing database and build out rich histories of ownership to enhance the value of your own database. And then just a final example, uh, a database of industrial manufacturers. And you're interested in getting beyond uh, SICK codes and NAICS codes to get to a deeper understanding of, of what these companies are doing and maybe their uh, processes they're using and, and their industrial activities and, and the nature of their raw materials. Uh, one interesting idea might be to go to the EPA and get their enforcement and compliance data, which is called the ECHO database, uh, which shows, uh, for example, not only if they're handling hazardous materials, but what hazardous materials. It shows uh, certain types of chemicals that they might be using. It deals with uh, certain types of processes that involve um, discharges um, and, and things like that. And I think with just a little bit of creativity, uh, you can get a lot of insight into what specific manufacturers are doing that takes you way below the level that everyone else is operating at, which is, which is typically some kind of industry classification code. So again, it's a mix of creativity and um, willingness to say, I'm not going to be able to get perfect information on every company, but what I can get will be a uh, very leveraged step up that will tend to make my overall database more valuable. Now I've whetted your appetite hopefully with a couple of sort of hypotheticals. Um, I wanted to also show you a couple of case studies of real life companies that have built very, very successful businesses uh, almost entirely off public data. Again, hopefully to get you uh, excited about the potential and get you thinking about the possibilities for your own business. 
Uh, first company I wanted to mention to you is called EDA, which is Equipment Data Associates. They're owned by Randall Riley. They're based down in Charlotte, North Carolina. What EDA does is it goes to each of the 50 states and uh, obtains what are called UCC1 financing statements. And these things you may or may not be familiar with, but whenever a business um, leases a piece of equipment or uh, finances a piece of equipment, typically the lessor or the financing party will file this UCC1 statement. And to boil it way down, basically it's meant to be a, a public statement that um, the person who's, who's financed or leased this equipment better dare not sell it off till they've paid it off. So it's sort of a, uh, a warning flag of sorts for other people so that another bank won't loan against the equipment that you've borrowed money for when you haven't paid the loan off yet. Uh, so these have all sorts of information in them. Uh, and what EDA does is in addition to having to get it from 50 sources, um, they often have to key information because a number of these states are still uh, maintaining these things uh, as scanned images rather than key databases. Um, then they have to deconstruct the information that's in there to, to make it searchable. And I'll show you what I mean by that because it's really unusual. Uh, they of course have to normalize the data to make it more searchable and make it more accurate. And they also append third party data on top of it so that they can pick up additional contact information and things like that. So there's a lot of value add going on here. And I thought I'd show you an example of this just because again it is uh, very unusual and specialized. The UCC1 financing statement fortunately is a standardized form that is used by all the 50 states, so at least they have the benefit of a common format. Uh, but again, some of it is keyed, some of it has to be keyed. And it starts out with a filing date. And the filing date is really important because if you know uh, someone's bought, in this case, a digital printer, uh, generally because you're in the industry, you know they're up for a new one in three or four years. So knowing when they bought it, uh, gives you insight into when they're ready to buy something new. And that's how EDA turns this into some very powerful sales leads. Uh, that also means that they have to maintain a history file. And that history file is fascinating to me. It goes back I don't know, 15 plus years at this point uh, because the states don't keep this information. And they literally now are the only source in the world for historical UCC information. And it's important to their business in terms of making this a powerful sales lead tool. But what they do, as you would ex is expect, is they uh, capture the name of who's, uh, who's financed the equipment. They've captured the name and contact information for who's bought or leased the equipment. And then most importantly, there's this little text description field where the bank or the leasing company types in exactly what was being financed. Um, now that's in there as text, which only has limited value. But what EDA does is they have a room full of people who actually go and field that information. So they take this thing that's a sentence and turn it into fields. So they break out the manufacturer, the type of product, the model number, even the serial number. And that feeds the searchable database. So if, for example, Minolta wanted to sell uh, new digital printers, they would say, uh, we really compete well against Xerox, and so give me all the Xerox digital printers that are more than three years old, and they can get from them. And I want them to be uh, of this, these model numbers because they're most equivalent to what we have. Uh, they can get out an incredibly targeted list of sales leads and do it very efficiently. Now EDA puts a tremendous amount of value add into this. Not all um, databases. Uh, public databases really are all this complex, but I wanted to sort of show you the possibilities to get you thinking about how you can take uh, rather pedestrian data, which is those, those text descriptions, and build a really powerful uh, fielded database if you're willing to make that investment in, in the data entry effort. Uh, another database you may be familiar with is called PEERS. It used to stand for Port Import Export Reporting System. It's currently owned by UBM Global Trade. And what PEERS does is it goes to the um, Customs Service and gets a uh, database uh, that details in extraordinary detail everything that's being shipped through the ports in this into this country via ports, and I think to some extent air as well. Uh, and those documents which are called customs manifests will have everything from the recipient's name and address, 
uh, detail line by line items of what's in those shipping containers, the quantities, the product type, the classification that it belongs to for uh, tariff purposes. It also, believe it or not, contains the name of the shipper, so where it was uh, sourced from. And that obviously becomes an incredibly powerful database. Um, they in turn take that database and they supplement it with additional data that they can't get um, as, as a database feed from the government. They do incredible amounts of work to normalize it so it's searchable. And they too append third party data to get more contact information. And think about the potential uses because uh, it's sales leads at one level because you're able to find everyone in the United States who imports men's sneakers from China if you happen to be a better source. Those are your sales leads. If you're a shipping company, you can find people who are shipping large quantities and you want to do deals with them. Uh, if you're a warehouse company, you can talk to them about warehousing their information. But there's also huge competitive intelligence uh, information here too because you can actually monitor your competitors, find out what they're buying, what quantity of what they're buying, and who they're buying it from, which is extraordinarily valuable. So it's a hugely uh, successful business that's been built over the years. Uh, I also wanted to point out another company called Pangeva. And this is very uh, important, I, I think, because Pangeva uses the exact same customs manifest database as peers, but they don't compete with peers. What they've done is flip the data in a different direction. And Pangeva is holds itself out as a sort of buying guide or purchasing source for people who want to buy uh, import products from other countries. And they just flip the data around in a different direction and say, if you're looking for men's sneakers in China, these are the companies who manufacture it. These are the ones who are shipping the most to the United States. Uh, and, and have actually made the, uh, a whole new business opportunity based on exactly the same data. And there's lots and lots of examples of this. So multiple commercial data publishers can live off the same data feed and actually never compete with each other in the marketplace, which I just find endlessly fascinating. Uh, this is actually a nonprofit group called GuideStar, which you might have heard of. Uh, fascinating story here because um, the tax returns of nonprofits and foundations have long been public information. But until fairly recently, the only way you get them is you have to write a letter to the IRS and four or five weeks later you would get uh, uh, some crooked photocopies back in the mail to look at. Um, what emerged from all, and GuideStar went to the IRS and said, we really think this data should be online. Why don't you give us the database and we'll make it available to the public to help with transparency and to inform um, how they give to different charities. And the IRS said, that's a great idea except for one problem. We never keyed the information. We just kind of key a couple key fields, scan it, and, and put it on a put it in the file cabinets basically. GuideStar actually partnered with the IRS and said, tell you what, uh, we'll key it for you if you just give us the raw materials, which the IRS did. And they have since built, built this amazing database of um, tax data for virtually every nonprofit and foundation in the country. And it's all available at GuideStar.org. And it's a rich, rich database. Uh, but their value adds, and again, I keep coming back to this, is they, um, they keep this microform source data that the IRS wasn't able to do itself. They did amazing amounts of normalization to, to make it more searchable and, and comparable. And then they've also linked the uh, data they've databased back to the actual image documents. So you sort of got the benefits of both. It's highly searchable, but you've got the source at your fingertips as well. So tremendous value add. And even though lots of people, um, anyone really could go in and ask for the same data, it's unlikely anyone's going to take on on GuideStar because of the huge investment they've made to build out this product and to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Their competitive defenses are very, very strong. Uh, Carfax, uh, actually a company in the news by coincidence, um, if you didn't read it, um, their parent company, R. Elpulk, was purchased uh, just yesterday by IHS for a rather remarkable $4.2 billion. And it was said 
it's been said in the press that IHS primarily purchased the company because they wanted to get their hands on Carfax, which tells you a lot. Uh, you're probably familiar with it because this sort of veers off into the consumer uh, side, but really what Carfax offers is detailed automotive history reports. And the idea is you can order one of these reports before you buy a used car to see if it's been in accidents, if it's been uh, abused, if it's been uh, poorly maintained and things like that to give you additional confidence before you buy a used car. Where do they get the data from? This is rather remarkable. They actually pull from a stunning 34,000 different data sources. Most of them are uh, public domain, either federal or state data, plus they license data from the car manufacturers and a bunch of other sources. But their value add, as you can see quite clearly, is that they've got this both massive aggregation and integration of multiple databases to put together a consolidated view uh, of an automobile that really is unavailable anywhere else, certainly not in any one place. And that, again, is the power of doing this. And again, I really like this example because it shows that you want to think past just getting your hands on a single public data source. Sometimes the real game, the real opportunity is to blend multiple data sources to get a product that really doesn't exist anywhere else and, and couldn't exist anywhere else. And uh, as a final example, uh, there's a smaller company called Judy Diamond Associates out of Washington. They're owned by Summit Business Media. What they have done is gone to the Department of Labor and got what's called their 5500 filings. Uh, every year, every company that has a 401k or pension plan has to fill out these uh, annoyingly long and complex forms that detail their 401k plans, how much is in the fund, how many employees are covered, uh, who their investment advisors are, tons and tons of, of fascinating detail about these businesses. And they took it, uh, scrubbed it clean, and, and really were selling it primarily uh, as sales leads to financial advisors and insurance companies and, and, plant, uh, and uh, mutual fund companies that wanted to talk to these uh, companies who are called plan sponsors and, and, and sell them different services. So a very straightforward thing, but it took uh, a lot of data standardization. This was an example of a relatively complex database from the government that's very hard to use uh, as an end user. They simplified the data presentation. And they also went out and verified a lot of the data to make sure that the contact information in particular was still um, valid. So pretty um, straightforward there. And again, I point out another company called Brightscope, which takes the exact same data set, those 5,500 filings, and has built a business that is totally non-competitive with Judy Diamond. What they do, and it's very innovative, is they're basically putting a score on every pension plan out there so you can look up your employer and say, uh, my, fun, my plan is doing really well compared to others. Mine isn't. And their notion is to monetize that by selling it back, uh, selling this information back to companies essentially as a benchmark uh, tool so that they can see how they're doing relative to, to peer companies and, and how far ahead or behind they are of the pack so they can presumably then tune up their uh, investment portfolio. So again, two companies using the exact same data source and going in very, very different directions. Uh, and that's sort of one of the magic elements of, of these public databases. You're really only limited by your uh, imagination. So having gone through some hypotheticals and some real life case studies, I, I again think it's worth repeating. Um, there's long odds these days about finding just a single freestanding public data set that you only have to scrub lightly and that you can turn into significant revenue. At the same time, I do believe there is lots of opportunities to creatively augment and enhance existing databases, as well as doing mashups of uh, multiple public databases to get to information that you could not get otherwise. Uh, you've got the opportunity to use public data to add high value data elements to your own existing database, to build out history where none may exist, to move you closer towards census coverage of an industry. You can use these databases as a way to identify new entities, new entrants into the marketplace. And you've got the opportunity, again, to pull these data elements in from multiple sources to build something even more powerful.
And this idea of, of the mashup, if you will, the, uh, the multiple sourcing of specific data elements that are integrated together, in, in the whole world of competitive intelligence, that it's called the mosaic approach, which you're basically trying to get these puzzle pieces and fitting them together until you can get a complete picture. Uh, and it is very doable with public data. And I, I just wanted to give you an example that um, I did this on a very rushed basis, but uh, this is a real company. They have a website that typically doesn't tell you all that much about them. And by going just to three separate public domain databases, you can build out a very substantial data record about this company, including information that I'd argue you could not get easily any other way. And again, these are just three that I picked. You could expand this to six or ten or, or, or pull different data elements. But again, just want to start you thinking about the ability of, of uh, using public domain databases uh, singly or in combination to, to either build out uh, a de novo database or to augment data that uh, you already may have in a data product. So there's a lot, a lot of power out here. And again, the reason I like it so much is you're only limited by your imagination. So how do you find these databases? Uh, it's, a, it's a very real uh, question that um, there's no single answer to, but let me run you through some of the possibilities. How do you get your hands on public data? Um, one of the most surefire ways is to look inside your industry and say, where are permits required? Where is there licensing required? Where is there compliance required? Uh, and trace those uh, requirements back to uh, specific agencies where you'll find more times than not it's being keyed into a database that you can usually get your hands on. Uh, you can dial for dollars within a uh, relevant agency. Just simply call them and ask around. Be prepared to set aside an afternoon or two for being forwarded and hitting voicemail and things like that. Uh, but once you get inside these agencies, a lot of them are actually pretty helpful and can give you insights. And you're most likely to find something that isn't known to the rest of the world if you kind of go in and poke around as opposed to going with some of the more obvious routes. Uh, you can certainly ask uh, users, subscribers to your own existing products. If you have a publication, ask your editors. Again, you're looking for what agencies are, are monitoring my or responsible for my industries, what ones are collecting information, uh, what do a lot of my companies have in common that uh, might create either uh, that requires some kind of regulatory oversight or, or compliance oversight, and try and trace that back to its source. Uh, it's sometimes useful to say who's doing market research in your industry and try and trace back some of their data sources. Often they have tapped into uh, aggregate government data that in turn is backed up by entity level data. Uh, I would urge you to remember that it's still not all been keyed into a database at this point. Uh, one of the <laughs> best examples of this uh, is con congressional disclosure forms. When Congress votes in a law that says we have to disclose all our stock holdings, for example, uh, they still allow those filings to be on paper with the hope that they'll just end up moldering in the basement somewhere. But those are just as accessible to you as, as a data file. And if they're valuable enough, you may want to invest in keying them yourself. And there's certainly companies that do that on a routine basis. Um, Quangos, you may not have heard the term. I just had to use it because it's such a great British uh, expression that uh, it actually stands for quasi-autonomous non-governmental <laughs> organizations, which is roughly the equivalent of our quasi-governmental agencies. Um, they exist in a lot of industries, and they often ask active data collectors or clearing houses. Uh, I would note, note, though, that their obligation and their willingness to release data will vary pretty widely. Uh, one great example I just read about, it was actually in the New York Times today, well, is FINRA, which, which monitors and regulates um, stock brokers and stock bro brokerage firms and, and a lot of other aspects of the financial services industry. They are this quasi-governmental quango, if you will. And um, they operate under a whole bunch of different laws. Like for example, the uh, officers of FINRA cannot be sued because they're acting in a governmental capacity. At the same time, FINRA is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act because they're not a governmental agency. So it's actually possible to have it both ways. And you just have to feel your way through. But uh, sometimes they, they're willing to uh, come off 
uh, large amounts of information simply because they don't want any controversy or they don't want anyone looking too closely at, at what they're doing or how they've uh, so conveniently set themselves up. I'd also point out to you um, that there's a surprising number of sites for investigative reporters. You can use them both for inspiration and for actual data sources. Uh, here are three of them. I just read about one a few minutes ago that's called uh, muckrock, M-U-C-K-R-O-C-K dot com. Uh, Again, there's just a lot of them out there, uh, and they they will sometimes uh, tell you where to get data. They will tell you about issues that uh, people are trying to wrestle with. Sometimes they actually go out and get the data themselves and process it, and, and you can actually get that data if you wish, although you have to be sure they're going to continue to do it. But uh, worth poking around and, and never dull, I guarantee you. Um, this sounds basic, but in some ways it's not. You want to check the websites of the relevant agencies. It really is amazing how they can hide uh, a valuable database on their website. Sometimes uh, I often find, too, that searching Google is the best way to search an agency website because their, their on-site search tends to be so poor. Um, and the thought of actually taking uh, a, a database and putting it in the nav bar or even mentioning it on the home page is just never seems to occur to most agencies. So you really do have to poke and sometimes poke pretty deeply. Uh, another interesting thing that's worked for me a few times is by law, uh, all the federal agencies at least are required to identify and make public what are considered their major information systems. And I find the easiest way to get a hold of those is just to Google that term along with the name of the agency you want, and it tends to pop right up. And this will tell you about the major data collection systems that these agencies maintain. Now, not all of them are necessarily uh, available to you in in toto, but uh, it gives you a sense of what data they are collecting and, and the possibility of getting subsets of data out of some of those major systems. Uh, I mentioned earlier data.gov, which is a website you can go to. It's meant uh, by presidential directive to be the central site for the public to get access to government databases. It's been expanded now to state data as well. Uh, they've all these federal agencies have been mandated to contribute data to it, but they were never was all that specified exactly what they had to contribute. So some of them are, are playing games by putting in real uh, nonsense files. Some of them are taking it more seriously. So it's a real mish mishmash at this point. Uh, last time I looked, it had about 75,000 uh, data sets in it, but that's a little bit misleading. You'll find that um, a single data set might be uh, butterfly migration pattern, uh, patterns in, in seven Iowa counties in 1980 to 2000. Um, useful to some people, but it, it gives the impression sometimes that there's a lot more data than there really is. Um, and I find that even if the desired data isn't inside data.gov, you can sometimes learn about government agencies or, or regulatory bodies you didn't know about that might be worth contacting, or it might give you some insight into state-level sources as well. And again, don't forget to explore non-digital data sources, uh, non-database sources. There's a lot of stuff that's still floating around, if not on paper, at least in microform some ways. And those uh, could potentially be the most interesting because uh, fewer people are going to know about them because they're often being purposely obscured. And even fewer people are going to want to make the investment to do anything with them. So. Um, Sometimes the, the oldest, stalest looking stuff has the potential to be the most valuable. The other thing I'd mention out with um, image files when, or microforms when they've been scanned is, is what we typically see is the agencies will build a database index to them. And sometimes that index could be useful in its own right, or sometimes it can just simply accelerate your uh, data entry efforts. So that's some thoughts about how to go poking around for this data. And, and frankly, you do need to poke around for it to find out what's in there. And again, the more common and well-known it is, probably the less valuable it is because others have, have taken it and shaken it and extracted value from it and reduced the opportunities for the rest of us to, to commercialize the data. So having, say, identified a data source, how do you actually go about getting it from a government agency? A um, number of different ways. You can, if they have the database online, you can scrape it. Um, it's not 
always permissible, so I wouldn't assume anything there. And I, I, I make sure you're in the right on that before you plow ahead. Although a lot of the time, because it is public data and the agency is putting it out there for the public to use, and you're certainly entitled to it, the real issue is more about sort of being polite. And by, by what I mean by that is they don't want you hitting their servers so aggressively that uh, other people can't get onto it. So if you if you do it gracefully and extract data, usually there's no problem. But again, I, I don't want to speak to legalities of it because it could vary from database to database. Um, sometimes, literally, you can just call and ask for a database and get it. Uh, you may be pleasantly surprised on this. Government isn't necessarily the enemy of a lot of this stuff. And a lot of times, they don't care, uh, especially if it's not a lot of work for them. More times than not, what it comes down to is how much work it is. If you ask and they say no and you can't scrape it for some reason, then you can move to the Freedom of Information Act, which has actually been around, I think, since the early 1980s. It might even be a little bit older than that. And it's a very, very powerful piece of information at the federal level uh, because it creates a uh, an expectation uh, and a burden of proof on the agencies on why they shouldn't release data. So the, it, it, the whole thing is set up in the belief that all data generated by the government should be available to the public uh, with the exception of, of selected categories of, of highly specialized information. And it's the burden of proof is on the agencies to explain why they shouldn't give it to you. You don't have to make a case why they should give it to you. Generally, it's a simple and mechanical process. You write a letter uh, under it and say, per the Freedom of Information Act, I would like you to send me X. Um, and more times than not, you'll simply get it. Uh, agencies can be very slow, though, despite the law, which puts some time limits on it. And they can easily stonewall you if they choose to. They can really grind down the process. Um, although, and then you have to decide if you want to try and escalate it or, or make an issue out of it. Um, most agencies, even at the state level now, have a designated person or sometimes a whole office that's de dedicated to Freedom of Information Act requests. You simply push it to that office. They know exactly what to do. And this stuff does get tracked. Uh, and, and they are tasked with being responsive to them. Um, some agencies will try to char charge you really large fees for processing, uh, and they are allowed to charge you sort of cost recovery to get you the information. Uh, if they do try and charge something ridiculous, you can appeal it, and that's also uh, based in the legislation. Uh, interesting to me, and it took me a little while to wrap my head around it, is the intended use of the data is not a factor. Um, you can ask them to waive fees uh, if, if it's done for the public good. But other than that, they don't care if you're a business. They don't care if you're a commercial body. Your rights are the same as a private citizen, even if you're planning to take the data and resell it. And that, that's important to keep in mind. And a little known note, which I think is uh, ironic and important, is your Freedom Information Act request can itself be obtained by a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, and there are some um, competitive intelligence firms and others who monitor these things uh, to see who's asking to get their hands on what information. Um, so just be aware of that because you don't want to get uh, competitive exposure if, if you uh, are trying to be discreet about something. Uh, beyond uh, basic sort of copying and reproduction costs, uh, keep in mind that not all public domain databases are free. Uh, the court systems uh, in particular are fond of charging per record user fees. Uh, it's really hard to understand why that's legal, but who are you going to tell it to? The judge? <laughs> I think they, they kind of win on that one. Uh, you'll find that a number of states charge per record access for corporate um, filing such as a, a corporation records and business data like those UCC1 filings, for example, a number of states charge for it. It varies dramatically from state to state what those policies are. Although it's interesting that you can often call them up and buy the whole file in bulk at, at a vastly reduced cost. Uh, so they're, they're basically willing to deal, if you will. And what we still, and we do see that some companies will um, buy a database that might be a little pricey and then resell it to others who want to use it but who are non-competitive. And there really is no notion of licensing when it comes to public data. You know, nobody really publicizes that they do this, but it goes on all the time. So 
there are other angles to this too. We find that a lot of public bodies or these quasi-governmental bodies have aggregated data and made it available and they're selling it. Uh, one good example of this is the Federation of State Medical Boards which operates docinfo.org and you can go there and for a fee they'll tell you if your doctor has ever had um, any license suspension or revocation or disciplinary actions against them. Uh, but at the same time, most states you can still get that information for free. For example, in New York State, you could go to the link I gave you there and look up pretty much the same information and do it for free. So not always apples to apples comparisons, but it's worth knowing that even the aggregated source may be convenient, but if it's too expensive for you, sometimes you can sort of go in the back door and just get it from the original source with a little bit more effort but a lot less uh, cost. Uh, where things can go wrong, um, there's a lot of work being done by government agencies on redaction of personally identifiable information. Um, obviously, they're all scraping out social security numbers, but they'll often take out addresses and other information, and, uh, and that's to protect individuals. But it's not always clear what personally identifiable information is. There's still fights going on over that. Uh, one fascinating court case was in 2008. This company called Multi-Ag Media had requested under Freedom of Information uh, from the Department of Agriculture what was actually a geographical mapping file. And the Department of Agriculture refused it, saying that it contained personally identifiable information. And multi agnes said, what? And agriculture came back with this convoluted uh, argument that because the map showed the outline of the farm, and if you knew that the farmer grew corn, then you would know how much corn the farmer grew. Therefore, you could figure out the farmer's income, and that would be disclosing personal information. Um, this lasted in the court for years before uh, multi-ag media ultimately won. But again, these agencies, for right or wrong, uh, often have um, ideas of what's, uh, what needs to be redacted that goes, or what is not disclosable that would go far beyond what we would consider to be common sense. Uh, there are isolated cases where commercial reuse of government data can be restricted. One that I know of is the Federal Election Commission. Uh, you probably know if you make a donation to a candidate, you have to fill out a form. That form is actually goes into a public database. And there's a number of nonprofits, for example, that have taken that data and, and made it into searchable databases. Uh, what you can't do uh, with this data by um, statute is to use it for commercial purposes, however. Uh, there are not too many databases with this kind of explicit restriction, but they do exist. Another thing I'd point out to you, common sense, but boy, it, it's going to hurt you if it smacks you, is that either political considerations or just straight budget cuts can kill off entire databases. So if you're going to build a product or, or even your whole business off a database, get some real thought about how important it is in the overall scheme of the agency and, and could, could they live without it, how ingrained into the uh, infrastructure is it, how committed are they to it, because if you're going to depend on it, be aware it may not always be there. And even if it's there, also you have to remember that the agency can change at a whim and on a dime what information it collects, how it collects it, what frequently, frequency it collects it at, and, and do this without your permission, certainly. Uh, and if you're depending on specific data elements, they could just go away on you, uh, and you are at the mercy of your data source. Uh, what happens very commonly with government agencies is they'll have a, a taxonomy or some kind of classification system, and the publisher is getting the data and doing something important with that classification system, and then the government agency goes and revises it in a way so that the current data is no longer comparable to past data or mucks it up in such a way that it's unusable, and the publisher then is stuck because uh, the per these people have absolute control over what they're collecting, how they're collecting it and you don't have an awful lot of say in it, you can certainly go and, and, and make your case to them, but you're not the major constituency of these agencies. So again, uh, what the government gives us, the government can take it away. So some parting thoughts for you. Uh, again, if you're just looking for a database, you can, you can scrub up a little bit and start selling. You're probably about 25 years too late. Um, 
Interestingly, the majority of applications for public domain databases are for sales leads, but there's lots of room to be a lot more creative than that. And I think that's where some of the fun stuff is starting to bubble up these days. I think if you're going to base a product on public domain information, adding value is absolutely essential. You don't want to get commoditized. You don't want to have low-cost competitors out there. You always want to look to build to a specific application and then ultimately look to get into the user's workflow. And that means typically moving beyond data to move into tools. Uh, keep in mind that cleaning data is important, but that by itself doesn't really give you enough value add to, to stay uh, competitive and be differentiated these days. And that the whole notion of augmenting and enhancing your data using public domain data sets or individual data elements from multiple sources can add tremendous value. And there's still, I think, very, very substantial opportunities out there to do uh, data mashups uh, that are going to be surprisingly uh, powerful and valuable. Uh, don't forget the value of the census coverage I talked about. And always uh, look to any application and say, is there value in holding on to the history? Because if you get the history from a public database, you may find that you've got it, and at some point the agency's tossed it away, which puts you, of course, in uh, an enormously powerful position. So sorry for running a little bit over. I hope that was helpful to you. And um, I'll leave it to Kathy whether or not there's time for questions. Thank you, Russell. Um, we've been getting a lot of comments and questions throughout the webinar, and I'd like to thank everybody uh, very much. I just want to reiterate what I mentioned in the chat window, is that we'll be providing an on-demand version of this webinar plus copies of, of the slides. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of interest here. There's quite a few people that have hung on past the hour. So uh, let, let's take a few questions. I, I know that we have them here. And if we don't get to your question, again, uh, we'll just uh, follow up with you individually. Uh, one question that came in is, can you speak to the various business models to exploit these various uh, databases that you talked about, Russell? Um, there's a variety of business models. Most of the ones I see are taking these public databases, flipping them around so that they're optimized for a different application, and then selling them on a subscription basis. Uh, Far less often we see people grabbing them, putting them out there, and surrounding them with advertising. There's just fewer opportunities there. Uh, and then we're seeing um, occasionally people just sort of playing with them and putting it out there sort of to build, for free to build traffic on their sites or, or for some other uh, objective. But I would say, um, you know, as I think about it, overwhelmingly most of these get turned into subscription products. And most of those subscription products, uh, because the database has been reorganized and, and re-centered to make it into a sales lead tool above all, but that's certainly not the only application. Okay. I'll, I've decided I'm just going to randomly do three questions. Um, Here's a question. The technology for data aggregation seems to advance exponentially. What are the risks that an investment in integrating multiple databases might in a few years be rendered moot by the innovative um, application of tools like XML or RSS? Anything like that on the horizon? Um, it's a huge question. I, I think the way to think about that is, yes, it's scary what technology is capable of doing and how we're able to put files together and do things that just didn't seem possible uh, a few years ago. But I, I think, again, it really ultimately comes down to the application. If you have found a use for the data, a, a very specific application, you've optimized for it, uh, and you've built tools around it, you're embedding yourself in the user workflow, and, and maybe above all, you're, you're capturing a niche rather than a massive market, it, it's really not worth it for a lot of people to take you on at that point because it's too harsh to dislodge you. And the opportunity you're chasing, which might be fine for you, isn't big enough to justify someone coming at you hammer and tongs. So again, I, I really think it, it's think less about the data than what you're going to do with the data and, and figure out how to protect yourself uh, by thinking through the application and, and how to deliver the most value to the ultimate end customer. Uh, thank you. Here's, uh, we'll take this as our last question. Uh, and again, if you haven't had your question answered, we'll follow up individually. Uh, what companies have developed great approaches or algorithms to gross up the data to estimate transactions in, in areas where public record isn't really comprehensive? Um, not sure I follow that one exactly. Um, so to estimate, so 
So what companies have developed great approaches to gross up uh, data to estimate transactions or other data? I, I think aware. it really is is variable by the market and by the data that's available. Certainly, if you're mm -hmm. going to get at a good public domain database and it has um, anything approaching census coverage, you're 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 almost already there. If you can find out, get to some percentage what percentage coverage they have, you can sort of estimate estimate the delta there. Um, I don't know that there's any plug and play tools for doing this because I think the, the there's too much variability in in the application. But I mean there's certainly ways you can do it. It's done done in market research and, and market sizing all the time. So the, the tools are there and I think these public databases are really just an enabler in most cases because they'll give you fast, deep, usually dependable data that, that's representative of an entire market. Well, good. Well, thank you, Russell. This has been very informative. I know that many in our audience here in the webinar agree from the comments. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for spending an hour plus with us. Thank you, Russell. On your screen are the calendar uh, to, if you'd like to participate in any of our upcoming events. If you'd like more information, go to www.fiia.net slash content. And that would uh, detail all the information on the things you see on your screen. So with that, Russell, thank you very much. I'll look forward to our next webinar together. And to everybody uh, on the webinar, I look forward to uh, having you join us next time. In the meantime, take care. Thank you all for hanging in there. Thank you. Please stand by.